because it's only downhill from here. Right. <laughs> yes. Um, so just in case it is actually starting to go live, I'm just going to start our little PowerPoint presentation and say hello to anyone that might be on just in case. But I do think we should just wait a minute or two to um, wait for people to show up since we started a minute early. So hi, everyone that is starting to join us. And thank you for coming um, and joining our Ask an Expert live event. Um, and I will actually introduce everything in like 30 seconds. Um, okay, I think I'm just going to get started. So hello, everybody that is already joining us. Um, welcome to our SASA Ask an Expert live event. Today we are talking about ancient world reenactments, um, led by Ellie Bennett, Dr. Eric Jellyman, and Edward Rousen. Uh, just really quick, what is SASA? SASA stands for Save Ancient Studies in America. Our mission is to reverse the current downward trend in the study of the ancient world by engaging the public and bringing together students and scholars to share their passion for the study of the ancient world in order to inspire vast new generations of students. Um, of course, go to saveancientstudies.org to find out more about that. We actually have a ton of projects. Usually I mention a few right now, but I don't even know which one to say because we have a lot of things coming up, um, including an end of the year fundraiser and a survey to find out how people got into ancient studies. Uh, so follow our social media channels to hear about all of these fun things that SASA is doing and also see our Inspire campaign post where... Um, interns from over the summer made content for what we post basically five days a week on SASA's Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. And then we also have our recordings for all different kinds of videos, but our live events are recorded and posted on YouTube. So some protocol for the live event, please be kind and respectful, listen and ask thoughtful questions throughout the event. Please send in your questions, you guys. Um, please be patient with technology and those administering it. SASA live events are live streamed and recorded on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. And then those recordings are posted on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. And have fun. Again, today's Ask an Expert uh, live event is on ancient world reenactments. And basically with that, thank you for joining us. And I'm going to hand it over to Ellie to get started. All right, thank you, Lauren. And uh, I'm just going to make sure that I can share my screen. That is... Ellie, when you said that, I just realized I wasn't sharing my screen during that. So I was looking at this PowerPoint presentation. Sorry, everyone that just missed it. If you came to other live events, normally I'm showing this PowerPoint, but at least I read it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, <You're> amazing. <laughs> thanks. Okay, I Okay, I'm pretty sure you can see my screen. I'm going to press present. Okay, so today's live event is going to run a little bit differently because we are not historians. We are reenactors. Well, I'm a historian, but the other two people here today, Edward, if you can say hi. Hello, I'm, I'm Edward. Uh, I'll be the one wearing glasses tonight and with the big headphones. So, hello. <laughs> And Eric, if you can say hi as well. Hi, I'm Eric. I'll be the one who occasionally slightly jingles. <laughs> Eric will be very festive today. Um, and we are reenactors, and we're going to be talking to you today about some of our experiences reenacting the ancient world. So, who are we and why are we experts? Uh, we are the Committee of Immortals Reenactment Group. It was founded this year. And our focus is on portraying uh, the period of Achaemenid Persia. So that's approximately 553 BC to 330 BCE. And is made famous by uh, movies like 300 and participating in the Greco-Persian War. Uh, us three are the committee. I'm the chair. Eric is the treasurer. The jingly man is the treasurer. That's quite helpful to think of. And Edward is the secretary. And together, even though this group is brand new, we've been reenacting cumulatively about 30 years. So we have a good experience of reenactment as a hobby 
and an, a real intense interest in reenacting the ancient world. So I wanted to start off by just going, what on earth is reenactment? Uh, it's kind of a catch-all for a bunch of different activities, but it's short for battle reenactment. So what we do in that is we tend to go to uh, community events in the UK, that's where we're based, um, and they tend to be hosted in uh, fields or uh, mainly fields <laughs> that we go to and uh, take over an arena and we pretend to be in a battle and we kind of recreate ancient battles on a much, much smaller scale, just because we can't physically feel thousands and potentially millions of troops. That's just not possible. And generally speaking, reenactment has two main branches of what we do within that. The first of which is the combat side, and that is the fighting and recreating ancient battles. And key to that is making sure that we dress as me and Erica in the uh, correct way and using weapons that are as close to the ancient weapons as possible, whilst also maintaining some level of safety. And the other branch is something called living history. And that's when you are sat in a camp when you're not fighting and you are just uh, existing as if you were an ancient person. So you drink out of things that are like ancient bowls, you eat ancient food, you drink ancient drinks, and you often sleep in ancient tents as well, or at least as close to ancient tents as possible. And depending on the group that you are part of, there are different uh, emphases. So on some groups, they really want to be uh, just living history based. So they try and make things as uh, the key word is authentic, as humanly possible. So as uh, correct to the ancient items as humanly possible. But other groups, their focus is entirely on the combat. So their focus is giving an impression of warfare but maintaining as, as much safety as humanly possible. So I want to spend a little bit of time about how we got into this hobby. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, Eric, how did you get into this very strange hobby of ours? So I started off at the University of Birmingham as a physicist, and I happened to see people uh, out on campus, like hitting each other with swords and stuff. And I thought, that looks like a lot of fun. Like the, the time period or whatever didn't actually matter. I just thought that looked like a lot of fun. And now nine years down the line, I'm still doing it. And how I got into the hobby is I am also Eric's partner. Um, I'm his fiance and he, I entirely blame him for getting into the hobby. Um, he dragged me along to a session and uh, the photo at the bottom is Eric at his first show at Hastings and the photo at the top is my first show at Jorvik and Edward what was how did you get into the hobby? Uh, so it's, it's rather odd I have a very different experience of the hobby of reenactment because whilst a lot of people uh, especially in the UK can join through uh, university groups that's where sort of a lot of our membership can come from um, I ended up going to a reenactment event as a member of the public when I was 12 years old after playing probably about 200 hours of Rome Total War and watching Time Commanders and watching all sorts of films and reading all sorts of books. And when my dad was walking away getting food or something, I walked up to them and asked them how to join and somehow managed to press scanning him and my brother into doing it as well. Uh, and yeah, they just gave me a big helmet in this photo. I'm about a foot and a half taller now uh, than I was in that photo. Um, but yeah, it was just sort of turning up to an event and just being able to walk up to a group asking how you join. And they just told me to come back and gave me lots of shiny things. I think one thing that is common amongst all reenactors is we're all magpies and we love shiny things. Um, so I think the next question is, why did we choose to do a group that to portray Achaemenid Persia and the Achaemenid Persian period? It is a very underrepresented period and culture in the UK in general. So not just in the reenactment world, but also in terms of uh, youth, the UK education system, it's very underrepresented. And we have we had previously gone to events and uh, generally speaking in a lot of what we call multi-period events where there are groups from across the historical spectrum turn up. Uh, the, the oldest one was always a Greek group and it was always great fun to watch. But the problem was it was uh, the narrative that was used with the Greek group because they would always portray the Greco-Persian War 
And they would always adhere to the narrative that Greeks are always the goodies, they're fighting for Western civilization, and the Persians are the barbaric horde trying to destroy the fundamentals that's the Athenians and democracy and blah, 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 blah. Wait, and it meant that the Persians were the baddies and no one wanted to portray them. And that narrative is extremely outdated now. Um, I myself love ancient Near Eastern history. I'm actually doing a PhD in the Neo-Assyrian period, which is about uh, two to 500 years before the Achaemenid Persian period, roughly. I probably got my maths wrong on that one. And because of that love of ancient Near Eastern history, I wanted to try and fix that narrative and bring it really up to date. And I really love this photo because this was, oh, sorry. I really love this photo because it's of our uh, our small Achaemenid Persian infantry block at the last show that we did. And uh, I think two of them, it was the first time they participated in the fighting. So they're very, very, clearly very happy with being there. I also wanted to spend a little bit of time, like we could spend hours and hours and hours about talking about how great this hobby is and it's great fun. But I did want to bring up that it's not perfect and there are some problems throughout UK reenactment and I wanted to bring this up so that we can talk about it a bit in a bit more depth later. Uh, the first one is that it's not a very diverse hobby. Fundamentally this is a hobby anyone should be able to participate but the majority of people who join are male, middle-aged, white, overweight, cisgendered, straight, mostly able-bodied <laughs> and bearded. I say mostly able-bodied because it's scary how many of us have asthma and other like crippling respiratory issues. <laughs> um, I think all of, the, all of the committee have some sort of respiratory condition. <laughs> um, but that is, that's the demographic that's represented, which is obviously not ideal. And even though, and we want to try and change that, even though we're an all white committee, we want to try and open that door and try to change it a little. And I want, and it's why I chose this image because even though I'm not hugely diverse, it is a picture of me, a woman portraying a Persian general at, a, at an event, which I know for me, when I saw uh, another woman doing reenactment, that got me into the hobby and representation is really important. So that's one of the core values of Immortals at the moment. There's also an issue in terms of access, and this is kind of in two broad categories. One of them is access in terms of money and in terms of the outfits. Uh, what you dress in tends to only look perfect if you are willing to commission an item for thousands and thousands of pounds. And quite frankly, none of us have that kind of money to spend. So we've had to learn to make our own kit. So it's never perfect, but at least it's good enough for us to feel like we can put it on display and say we're doing an impression of the period. But it does mean that some people can get quite gatekeepy in terms of who should be allowed to represent what periods because they think that only perfect representation is the best, is allowed, essentially. There's also the other side, which is the, the physical aspect. A lot of these events that we go to are, like I said, in the middle, of, in a field in the middle of nowhere. Just from the very basics of if you're in a wheelchair, some of the events are quite difficult to get to and quite difficult to actually move around. And even then, a lot of these events are in rural places in the UK, which if you know anything about British public transport, that's a nightmare to get to. So you have to have access to a car already in order to get to these places. So it means that the demographic that comes and the public that comes to us largely look like the demographic who is representing the history to them, which is also not great. And we're hoping as well in the future when, when you know, COVID is over, and we can book things, we're hoping to book things in more accessible places as well. And the final thing I wanted to touch on is a really interesting tension where a lot of reenactors really want to be up to date with the most recent research and they really want to keep on top of things. But the problem is most reenactors are not historians. They're like Eric, they're physicists, they're chemists, they're policemen, they're from all, works of, all walks of life and just have a deep enthusiasm and passion for history but it means that they're not historians. So they do not have access to the really expensive academic books kept in libraries and the really expensive articles that you have to pay to access unless, you're, unless you are an academic, which results in things like out of date narratives being used to explain history and winding up historians. 
but that's not because of, that's not on the fault of reenactors. That's on the fault of a wider system, I think. And I wanted to talk about that a bit more because that's a central goal of Immortals is breaking down that gatekeeping. Uh, if you're not a member of Immortals, what we are going to do is once we have the kit guides, we're going to produce kit guides that are free to access on our website. And those kit guides are basically, this is what you need to achieve. This is the, the clothes, this is the weapons if you want to be a specific Persian warrior. Or this is what you want to be if you want to be our baddies, the Greeks. <laughs> Uh, and that will be in the kit guides and will be free to download as and when we actually are able to publish them. But something as well that's really important to us is for our membership, uh, if you become a member, then you have access to our Google Drive, which has a whole series of PDFs that are made available to members. So if any one of our members who are brand new, for example, and want to learn more about the history, then they can access some of these otherwise unattainable uh, pieces of scholarly work that would really help them understand the period. And that's what the, the, the little table at the bottom is my screenshot of our growing library <laughs> online. I, something that we've, all, that we've found in terms of outreach is in terms of reenactment, people really respond to physically interacting with the objects that we bring. Uh, on the top right is an image of our camp at the last show. And what we tend to do is because we know that the people who tend to come are interested in the combat side of things, so they're interested in the military history, we always make sure that our weapons that are, are safe uh, can be handled by members of the public whilst unsupervised by one of us. So they can feel how heavy a spear is and they can feel how heavy a helmet is and feel how heavy a shield is. And that's something that people really respond to, particularly when they have small kids and the kids will come up and ask if they can hold something. And then the parents will start asking more in-depth questions like, so what exactly are you, are you reenacting? What exactly are you portraying? Why are you wearing pajamas? Why are you wearing this? What, what is happening on that table over there? And we find that that's really, a really good way of getting conversation and interest in this period. And something that is, has definitely stood the test of time is we have uh, the board games of Ur, which is a very ancient game, even by Achaemenid Persian standards, but was played right up until the introduction of Backgammon. And we sit down with the public and teach them the rules and then they can play with us at events. And again, there's something, you can see the, the sparks going off and you can see the cogs whirring and the interest. And really, Edward is proof that this works. I mean, how he got into this hobby, as he said, like he uh, got into the hobby, found it really cool. And then correct me if I'm wrong, but you went off and did an undergraduate degree in ancient history. Do you want to talk more about why you did that? Yeah. So it's, I, I think this is really the most important thing that I can say about reenactment is that even if, if you don't want to be a reenactor and you don't want to sort of get involved with that, that's fine. But I would always recommend everyone, or if you can try and get to at least one thing with either a living history or a combat element to it. Um, for me, it obviously inspired that, that interest. I immediately became sort of obsessed with, with hoplite warfare and the Greco-Persian wars. And uh, I went to university of Leicester and um, completed my, my undergraduates in that uh, sort of writing my dissertation on Spartan, uh, the helots in Sparta. Um, but it's, it's, it can't be understated, it can't be overstated enough how important it is because it makes it more real. It's like actually brings it to life for people because uh, you can be uh, reading about, you could be reading um, the journey of the 10,000 in Xenophon, essentially about the Greeks fighting their way back after the, the disastrous expedition into Persia. But like, it, it seems all right. It's just a load of people walking. But then as soon as you go and actually pick up like an aspis, pick up, pick up one of the Greek shields and sort of like, can you hold this for five minutes? Could you hold it for however many weeks, months it took for them to do it? It creates that very real connection with people in the past um, that otherwise is lost. And it's sort of makes, no matter what culture you're part of, no matter where in the world you come from, it makes you realize that, you know, these people in the past were real and it does give that more human connection to it, uh, which... Again, that's what inspired me to keep going on. That's what I try to inspire in other people at events. And it's just generally like why I think reenactment is such a good part of it. Um, and yeah, so that outreach is, is really important. It's definitely affected my life in a big way. Mm. I think, to be honest, I think reenactment has affected all of our lives in a big way. As Eric has said, we have a kit cupboard. Well, the spare room is the kit room. And even then we have overflow. Um, but yeah, it's, 
I really wanted to bring this up and I really wanted to bring it to uh, a wider audience because it really does fit in with the wider goals of SASA, of, of uh, inspiring people to take their interest in the ancient world further. And again, like your, Edward, your, your uh, career path, as it were, <laughs> educational career path is really proof of it. And, is, and I hope that people take on board that re after this, that reenactors are a resource that can be deployed to help inspire this interest in the ancient world. So on the end of that, I'm going to keep this slide up, but if after looking at that brief, in brief introduction, uh, you have any interest in following what we do and following our progress, because we've literally, like this group has literally just started, um, then follow us on Facebook. We have a Facebook page of Immortals Reenactment. We have Instagram, so follow us on at Immortals Reenactment Group. Twitter, at Immortals Group. We also have a website. It's a little bit complicated, but uh, hopefully that should be sent out as well so that people can easily find it. And that's, we, uh, we're slowly adding more and more resources onto there as time goes on. If you are so inspired by us that you want to support us monetarily, so with money and spend money our way, uh, we are a non-profit. So all the money goes back into the group. We don't take any of that money. And you can go to Redbubble and search Immortals Group and you can spend some money on some wonderful merchandise that has our logo, the little uh, gold lion in the bottom right corner. And if you're so inspired that you are interested in joining us, then please get in touch uh, through the email at the bottom of the screen. That's immortalsreenactmentgroup at gmail.com. Ah. <laughs> So, yeah, and it's 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 important actually with these with these links as well. Even if like you if if you want to follow our progress and things like that, and you're inspired by it, even if you don't become a member, even if you don't take up reenactment yourself, but you're like, you know what? Actually, I do. I've I've seen people online who take it on themselves to try and just build some of the armor essentially for fun. Um, some people do it for school for school projects, and it's that kind of thing that we'd love to see. And I'm sure if like if you if you do look at our kit, guys, look at our photos, want to recreate something, or if you see something in a museum, read it in a textbook, anything like that. If you make it, draw it, anything like that, it's it's one of those things that gets the conversation going. So, I mean, we'd love to see it if you'd like to post it anywhere on our social media or if you obviously let Sasa know. Sasa would be more than happy to share that because it's that enthusiasm that reenactment can bring to people. So, uh, yeah, just follow those links, but also sort of obviously let us know how you get on if you uh, actually take it on at all. Yeah, brilliant. Um, yeah, so, definitely. Sorry, just to jump in really quick. Definitely let us know. Um, me, Ellie and I have been in the talks of doing more stuff with reenactment kind of themed things um, with Sasa and that kind of thing of like you trying to make your own stuff, whether it's armor or pottery or an ancient recipe. We literally have a specific thing about ancient recipes with Sasa already. Um, so we love that. That's like one of my favorites too. So like send us ancient recipes, you guys. <laughs> um, but yeah i mean that's amazing i love it all right brilliant so i think from now on we can kind of just chat and discuss some things about ancient reenactment so i think i'm going to go first with my first question and that is edward why aren't you dressed for the occasion me and eric are we put on our persian outfits so why aren't you so um i i do pride myself that when i'm wearing my greek armor i do look excellent in a dress um the greek heat on is is nice and, and nice and skimpy sort of comes up to mid thigh and being a six foot ten man is is interesting when you wear something like that but as much as i look lovely in that uh it is 250 miles away in the south of england and i'm now in the north uh in the northwest um which kind of it's interesting because reenactment isn't just doing it in the fields and actually doing the events it's weeks months of of either research building and getting kit together and it's just interesting seeing that with covid that even something like this as much as we can't do the events it's even affecting my ability to do it outside of the events as well um which i think is something that everyone can relate to as well but it is something that you know i'm i'm going material shopping up here to try and find things to make sure i, could, I was trying to get kit ready for this and you know just everything got in the way um as as it is for a lot of people at the moment so uh, yeah. but it, it is one of those things which you can so no matter if your armor's 250 miles away and you can't sort of mend it, you could always try making some more or making a bag to put sling stones into if you want to sort of get that together, um, which again is something that we encourage. Or even safe sling stones. Yeah, so it's, it's one of those things where you just, 
it, it, it's so far away but it doesn't stop you doing the hobby if you've got the interest for it yeah. you can just go like cracking straight on with it you don't need to have a, yeah. a full kit room like eric and ellie <laughs> um as you see my room is my my room is considerably more tidy if the if the screen was so if you can see my face it's yeah. just the back wall but uh yeah absolutely it's just it's strange having everything that you've been doing for 12 years so far away but still having that that interest at the moment yeah and like uh I, I wonder if either of you Edward or Eric could say more about what kind of things we do outside of these weird events in the field in the middle of nowhere like when we're not doing that what is it that we do well I think the the main one that springs to mind is training so you know, we, we we have, you know, our living history element, of course, where we want to make stuff at home and to be ready for, for cancer, like the armor, etc. But we because of that combat element, there is there is obviously then a, an inherent risk in doing anything like that. So we actually have to train. And it, it's sad that this year, obviously, that because of COVID, we've not been able to train. But um it does feature as a really regular part of the hobby is doing that kind of combat training and it's not just you know sort of getting together and doing some very regimented you know activities we don't treat it as a sport in that sense it's very much a social activity um it's almost like a very weird version of rugby like it's you know it's very much a team sport because we need to portray both sides a lot of the time but we've got a lot of extra props you don't don't normally find in a team sport um but we also try and sort of build in we're trying to build in elements of using the language as well so there's there's a sort of there's a lot going on outside of what would just be sort of building kit and preparing for shows yeah so at the moment what we're trying to do is uh, every week we have a language club so at the moment we are slowly going through a uh, an introduction to aramaic because that was the lingua franca of the Persian period, um, so that we can try and be a bit more fluent and like perhaps do some small scenes in living history and have a little bit of acting going on. Um, but we're also doing social nights every week and we've done, oh, what have we done so far? We've done uh, a night where we had people uh, painting their wargaming miniatures because the, there's a huge overlap between those two communities. Um, we've had a craft night where people can come well do like a, a, a call over discord in the discord server and work on whatever bits of we call all of this stuff kit whatever piece of kit that they're working on and they can just keep on going and ask questions about whether something works or or what's the best way of doing something or what's the most authentic way of constructing a garment um and we're about to have a reading club where we're where I've assigned, it feels a little bit mean, but I've assigned people uh, an introduction to Achaemenid history and we're going to talk about that next week and we're going to have a film night. So as Eric said, it's all very nice and uh, social as much as it can be during COVID times. I do miss hitting people though with a, a sword. It's very cathartic. Yeah, as much as we miss hitting people with the swords as well, but it does sort of, again, not everyone gets into reenactment for the same reasons. So obviously we we love hitting each other with, with bits of metal and then shooting arrows at each other and things like that. But not everyone does that. We have a lot of people who love to come and do the living history element. They um, We've had someone who just sort of sits and um, cooks all day in ancient pots and things like that. And actually like we'll make those ancient recipes in front of the crowd full of people. Um, but even if reenactment isn't necessarily what people's end goal is, we, we, we have had interactions with people who don't necessarily want to go to shows, but love being able to talk about it with people, uh, which is, again, reenactment is just an excellent gateway to get people into just these social mm -hmm. circles. People who may come to one event, never do it again, but makes friends for life because they share an interest and they, they play Warhammer together or they, yeah. they watch films and things like that and meet up. Um, is, is one of those things because it is just this this huge community. I mean, it's not just obviously we're Achaemenid Persia, but the reenactment groups span decades. Like they, we've mm -hmm. got like there's English Civil War groups, World War II groups, Roman groups, everything like that. Um, so you do just get this entire spectrum of periods. As much as it's quite a small demographic, you do get these shared interests just spanning a timeline. Mm -hmm. So on that, what is your guys' favourite part of the hobby? Like, what is what is the thing that when you think of reenactment, that's that's the one thing that makes you go, "Oh yes, I love it." Uh, Eric, so for me, it's it's a fifty-fifty split. 
between the combat side of things. Like I get a real thrill out of doing the battles. Like it's, um, the, the, there's this aspect of immersion, but also, you know, I, I come from a background in college of having done a lot of team sports. And then when I went to university, that sort of fell away. And reenactment really replaced that need that I always had to do that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, the, the sort of immersive aspect of the combat just felt really cool and really exhilarating, but also making kit. Um, like I, I started reenactment just about able to sew on a button or maybe repair some item of clothing just about and probably poorly. And like a few years down the line, I'm now like wearing, like everything I'm wearing, I made. Like, and I've gotten pretty obsessed with like making uh, everything that I can, just because I, I like learning new skills, especially like skills with my hands. Like, I, like yeah. in the camp, I'll cook as well, but like I, I, you'll probably most likely find me either repairing or making armor in the camp. Yeah. Um, I'm going to interrupt because we've had a couple of questions through. So the first thing is, uh, do you play ancient video games with your reenactment friends? Yes, <laughs> I play a lot of ancient video games. Um, a lot, as I said, like I got into the hobby with very young age. I was playing Rome Total War and things like that. So again, it's like, you know, there's six of us hitting each other in a field and then you go away and can command thousands of men and like, hit each other with that virtually um, is, is always good fun. And it's, again, just fans historic games, but yeah, not just ancient games. Like we play everything essentially. Yeah, I think the best way to describe a lot of reenactors is just nerds in the most loving way possible. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of us do play a lot of video games. Um, I prefer my video games being more historical and and escapist because my work is ancient history. But yeah, I know a lot of people who play ancient video games. Uh, the second question is: Is having online meetups something you plan to continue after COVID, so that people who can't make it to the reenactments can still participate? Like uh, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the obviously with COVID nineteen, we're able to um, so sort of we we are able to keep the social um, gatherings going online uh, much more because obviously, I mean, I'm working remotely from home at the moment, so it's easy for me just to swap across to a Discord server to get ready uh, when we return to some form of normality. Um, I mean, most likely the events may peter out a little bit. We may not be having two events a week, something like that. But I feel. Uh, the language club that we have and um, sort of the reading clubs, things like that to get people involved in the history will definitely keep going. Um, and then these extra social meetups playing video games, which are just ad hoc. People put something in the Facebook group or something like that. We could just immediately get that sorted and live stream events such as this. I'm sure we can work out the technology to get that going as well. So yeah, absolutely something we're looking to keep going. Yeah, because even though we're based well, in the, the UK, the UK online... is still... Sorry, go ahead. Yes, sir. I think I think the the very nature of the, the the online forums that we've got set up already have already proven to be really great, not just for social but aspects, but for organising ourselves as a group. Because we, you know we've got members all over the country, and even without COVID, not all of them would be able to make, say, a training event or a social event in another part of the country, and so if we needed to make decisions or if we just wanted to touch base and just have a chat like these online forums are really useful for that so i doubt we'd abandon them at all like we'd still be using them just to organize things and of course we don't then want every single online event post covid to be just formal this is us organizing ourselves it would turn into a social thing just because we're all friends and we're all talking on online like it it, 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 it would descend into chatting anyway yeah, it would. It always descends into chats. There's another question, which is, what is your favourite ancient video game? Uh, Eric, do you want to go first this time? Because I've, I've said my answer like three times. I think, I, yeah, I think I'm, I think we're probably going to have the same answer. But for me, it's it's Rome Total War. Um, mm -hmm. Just because it a very early age got into it. And like even now, I still will play it occasionally just because it was just it was a it was a hook from an early age i think it's it's it says a lot about how this hobby and how 
playing Rome Total War from such a young age has influenced our lives because uh, myself and my younger brother, we obviously have both been doing reenactment. We both did the Greek side of things and he's uh, just built himself a humongous like monster rig PC, uh, 4K monitors, everything like that. And immediately the first thing he does is load up Rome Total War, a game from 2004 that cannot run above like 60 like 40 frames a second or something like that so it's oh it's so crisp but you could just see all the polygons just not quite meshing and things like that um and it's games like that yeah, again I think, just... I think it's amazing how big of an overlap there is between the strategy games and reenactment is because there's so many people who play either the real-time strategy games of you know rome total war or even like the later total war games and people who play war gaming so the turn-based strategy battle strategy games and then reenact because it's like a it's almost like a closed circle mm. <laughs> and then there's me on the outside going i just like to play rice and a robe <laughs> yeah. and again yeah with the with the war gaming side of things as well i mean like again that that's a huge overlap as well uh i know i've had experiences of someone doing an ancient um system like getting a greek army and has sunny like sent a message through to me asking like oh what do i paint on the shields what do i do that and that's your chance just to share all these resources and things and um had people you have you suddenly start seeing people you're speaking to they start painting you a miniature form like a couple of my mates have been painted in people's armies with basically their kit their colors their shield devices yeah. everything like that all painted across onto it so it does just sort of spread we across friend, we have a friend who's in charge of a medieval army and he started painting all of us in medieval in our medieval colors <laughs> as an entire army which is quite scary to look at really um yeah i, I just, I just can, uh, go on you can end up in the very strange situation where you end up getting uh, uh equipment and kit envy over something that's about an inch tall yeah Yes, that's, you're looking that's, at it and that's you're going, very real. Yeah, like my stuff's good, but this is nice. I want to look that. People, <laughs> I've, I have had people send me pictures of ancient models going, so I can have this kit, right? And I have to sit there going, what is the ancient source? Yeah. <laughs> you need to show me the actual historical source, and then I can tell you if you can have it or not. Not something on a miniature that's possibly imagined. Yeah. <laughs> But what's what's been really nice at the moment? We've had in, we've had interactions like as I say, the group is is relatively new, uh, sort of formed like in the past month or so. But we've already had interactions on our social media of people having painted um, sort of Persian models who have have no connection to the group or anything. They're not members and they're just posting it, saying, "Guys, look what I did!" And it's like it's that kind of interaction that that we're getting as well. Um, yeah. I'm very I'm very worried that this is turning into a war gaming discussion <laughs> though because like this is a down oh, spiral. To bring it back to video games just briefly, I just wanted to think say that I know you don't want me to say this Belly, but I think an honorable mention for ancient video games should be Assassin's Creed Odyssey up to a point. Okay, okay, just a sidebar. If only okay. because I remember I love, how happy you were Arcanology. with the first like couple of hours. Okay, so this is the playthrough of me playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Oh, this is so cool! They've actually got a lot of the archaeology! This is so awesome! Aliens! It's almost threw the controller across the room. Oh, and I've not picked it up since then, and it's the Assassin's Creed bit that made me too angry to continue. So, so as, I have a love relationship with that game. As someone who played that game all the way through and 100%ed it, because I'm a nerd... Um, games like that are a really good way as well like I'd, I'd always recommend someone have a go at it um i think the big takeaway i had was um i was fortunate enough when i was 18 to go uh with my college to uh, greece and we had a week traveling around we were in athens we went to delphi um we went down to sort of arco corinth every um, all those sorts of places uh, olympia as well and um it was incredible like it was obviously these awe-inspiring places especially delphi and then running through this video game and then just suddenly standing there and just being like this is this is actually how it was in real life and it's like it's like i've i've stood here and this is it's so weird seeing it filled with people and no matter how much you want to take away the accuracy and things like that of it the fact that it's actually mapped on a real place is pretty incredible um which is obviously something to yeah it is it is amazing walking around is amazing walking around it and then going oh i've been there and this is all correct i remember this exact spot that i was stood on had to jump back in and do a slight plug for sasa's archaeo gaming events because we do exactly this <laughs> um, so it is perfect no worries that you like 
you know, it's, it totally has to do with what you're talking about too, because this is a way that people get into the ancient world and build their little communities and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyways, yeah, uh, Sasa does Archeo gaming live events just like this, but it's streamed on Twitch and then the recordings are posted on the other platforms afterwards. So I totally like marked it down to do Rome total war. I'm sure it's already on our list. We just need to find experts to do it, you know, right. Um, so I'll send you my email. Yeah, yeah, no, seriously, if you, if you want to do one, definitely, definitely let us know. Um, we, we love Archeo gaming events. And I think it's a perfect thing that, like I said, just gets, it brings two worlds together. And I totally get your points on Assassin's Creed. I'm not really a gamer, but also the like, um, storyline side of Assassin's Creed and the newer versions is like where it's at. And it really is amazing for like teaching about ancient studies because it's rather accurate. And it, again, is something that like kids would be into. Kids would want to like, oh, we're playing yeah. Assassin's Creed in class today. Like, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so anyways, yeah. Awesome. Thanks guys. <laughs> Yeah, I think it just like illustrates how much of a closed circle it is. It's not a it's not a Venn diagram. It's overlapping circles. But what I what I think would be quite cool is if we kind of I have a whole bunch of slides that we can compare some of the objects that we have and we can talk through kind of the process. If you guys are up for that of like what we do and how we think about what we need to think about when we're doing reenactment because doing reenactment is a bit of a thought process that you have to get used to thinking about. So um, I think I might start off by asking you guys, what is your favorite weapon? <laughs> because Ooh. it is all based in military. So we might as well start with what is your favorite weapon? And we'll go from there. So I, I've, I have two, but the, the one I'm, I'm most in love with because it was the sword that I bought. I, I, saved, up my, I saved my pocket money and my birthday money when I was 14, 13 or <laughs> 14 years old and i bought a uh, a coppice um copus which literally translates as chopper um which is it's terrifying that someone let a 14 year old have it um which is basically I'm not sure i'd like there's always speculation about the relationship i'm not going to say there's a, any at this point it's similar shape to the modern day cookery that the gurkhas use like it's that um sort of forward bent saber which is just it looks messy um and it's it's the heaviest thing i've got it's got a lovely like bronze duck um for the hilt on it um which a weapon like that provides a very interesting challenge for reenactors because it is one that is designed to cut through things uh i mean all sorts are meant to do it but this one was particularly good at it um so finding a a safe way to use that uh make obviously the weapon safe originally and then actually the technique to do it is an interesting thing to do um which is so it's, probably worth, like, it's probably worth backing up a second and explaining what we mean by safe so when we do combat what we do is we use actual metal weapons and we do contact each other so they do hit each other um but we one of the reasons why we do training sessions and where we try to train as much well we will try to train as much as we can once covid is over um is so that we can hit each other but not too hard because the majority of the people on the battlefield are wearing what I'm wearing, which is just the linen pajamas. Um, not, not very many people will be wearing armor. And if a piece of metal, no matter how sharp it is, hits you, that's going to hurt. So that's what we mean by safe. We want things to be blunt and we want it to be eat, like used in a safe way by our members so other members don't get hurt. So that, that's kind of what I wanted to just define what we mean by safe. That's all. Um, and Eric is currently waiting to show off his spear. <laughs> well, but before I show that, I, I mean, I have a coppice with me, so you can see the, the forward bend on it. Um, and actually just to sort of demonstrate some of the sort of safety aspects. So you can notice that the tip is, is rounded. So that, there's my thumb for comparison. And the edge is quite broad. So this is completely blunt. Um, so I can grip that completely fine and that will do nothing. Um, but yeah, my, my favorite weapon is going to be my, my Persian spear. Let's see if I can get it all in shot. There we go. So it's got quite a broad, large, broad blade. So there's my hand for comparison uh, with a nice sort of ridge down the middle for support. And then at the other end, um, it has this ball. Uh, and it's like, a, let's see if I can rotate. This is not a very large room. <laughs> so the other end's got this ball. Um, this 
socketed on the bottom. Um, and I just, it's a lovely counterbalance. It's quite a chunky spear, but in two hands, it just feels amazing. And I've, I've, I've never not had fun using this. And I've just put on the screen, I hope people can see, because I have the chat box and the image of all of us talking. I hope those of you who can, who can see my screen can see that uh, we do try and base these on historical objects. So I've got an ancient spearhead and an image of, I didn't think through where to put the logo, so I apologize about that. Um, an image on a frieze of an Achaemenid uh, bodyguard with the spear that Eric is holding, basically. At the bottom there is that, that ball for the counterbalance. So we do try and match things. So whenever we talk about a weapon, I'm going to make sure that there's the ancient comparisons on here. Um, my favorite is uh, totally different. I love doing archery and I'm just going to try and go back on the slides. Um, so archery is a bit of a weird one in terms of making safe um, because I have on the slide these uh, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, yep, wonderful arrowheads which are cumulative, but they're a really good example of how we can't really do archery safely if we just blunt stuff because these arrowheads are something called trilobal, which uh, it means that they have uh, three cutting edges. So if they pierce something, then it means it's much, much harder for the skin to actually like, uh, to, uh, sorry, I'm just like, needing to read something. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, that was a technical thing. I'll keep on going. But because these have like these three edges and when it pierces the skin, it then um, makes it harder for the skin to recover. And I think Eric told me that it's actually technically a war crime to be hit with something like this. So, and these are so small that you would basically be hitting people with like a metal ball on the end of a stick, which is really not good when they're being thrown through the air. So in in the circles, there's like two elements of safety with this. And one of them is arrows. So uh, the arrows that I use, it's a very long shaft. The uh, I call these my orc arrows. They don't look very pretty, but the fletching is enormous and that's designed to slow the arrow down. And at the other end, there's something called a blunt. So this is just green rubber. It's very, very bendy. And if that hits someone, then it won't hurt them too much and that's and that too much is really key because that's the other half of of archery and that is the bow oh. this is the bow that i use it's not strong at the moment um right. ellie do you want to turn off screen sharing just to just to get a oh yes of course. Sorry. Shot of it? yes so this is my bow it's not strong at the moment hence the dangly bit and uh, it's a rough approximation to a Persian bow because I have no money and can't afford that and it's scary. And we have a limitation on bows of, uh, they have to be less than a 35 pound draw weight. So uh, these are basically very, very, very weak bows um, that we use so we can never hurt someone too badly. Like it will sting a little, but it's like paintball and people love playing paintball. Um, but, but I really enjoy doing it. I think it really adds another dimension to when we do battles and when we do battlefield displays because then we do loads of lobs and it looks awesome. Um, uh, there, there is a question in the chat, which is, do you guys make your own weapons or are there professionals who specialize in making weapons for reenactment? I think there, yeah. there, there are two stages to this. Um, there are some weapons that we can make ourselves, um, which are like, uh, like the arrows that Ellie and Eric were just showing um which are literally just get the dowel the feathers uh cut the notch and have the blunt on the end of it um where it gets a bit more tricky is where metal work is needed so for spear tips um for blades so the coppice that eric was showing uh was made by a blacksmith for us um but what we can do is we sometimes will get these elements individually and then throw them together ourselves. So, I mean, at our last craft night, um, one of our members was putting a javelin together, um, which was lovely when you're trying to do a microphone and someone's like hitting a hammer on a metal uh, sort of spearhead right into their microphone. But um, 
it's it's that element where we can take these different elements and then show members how to get them put together um which is oftentimes the cheaper way to do it as well like taking out that labor aspect uh which again makes it more accessible for us yeah and then there's also the other extra thing so eric and eric is like the master of making all the extra stuff for weapons um but I'm, I'm mainly proud because this is like the second one I've ever made. Eric has made like millions, but uh, I didn't, for example, I didn't make the sword, the Akanakas, but I did make the scabbard um, to go to hang from my belt. And Eric goes one further and he is like a wizard if you want to show any of your scabbards, Eric. Let's see if I can get it in the camera shot. So I actually have the, uh, the scabbard on me at the moment. Um, so I'm, I'm quite proud of this. Um, and I've even got it with, uh, I looked at a few um, uh, reliefs and found there was a garter used in order to secure this to the leg because for ages, I'd be wearing this with this slung on my belt and it would sort of start flapping all around the place. It would get tangled between my legs. And I was thinking they must have, they must have had a solution to this. They must have had something to hold it in place. It can't just have been one point of contact. And then I ended up looking at more reliefs when I visited the, um, museum and I saw a garter being used nice simple solution that makes so much sense so since I put that on I've been really really happy with the way this wears just uh, just a point as well on that um, like again one of the things that we're trying to do in Immortals is make things more accessible for people and there are workarounds for things essentially so uh, I wanted to jump in quickly because the image that's on the screen at the moment is one of my favorite artifacts that they have a copy of in the British Museum, um, which is either, uh, it's, it could be either a Persian, but mostly in a Nakiakos um, scabbard, essentially, which was slung on the hip. And we have these reliefs showing how they are sort of slung backwards. The one in the British Museum is plated in gold, um, which whilst would be lovely, is uh, completely out of budget for the budding reenactor, essentially. Um, my my younger brother, um, he has an Anakiakos, which has a wooden version of it to scale, uh, but it's wooden painted um, with reliefs on. So it's like it's the patterning that we have um, on the reliefs with the uh, real item, but making it again accessible because not everyone in the not everyone in the Achaemenid Persian Empire is going to be able to get a gold plated scabbard for what is essentially. A lump of metal that they might never use essentially whereas if you're in a more practical sense fighting every day and you need something to be robust something that's not going to you know worry about it getting damaged and spending loads of money on it a wooden alternative or leather is sort of the way forwards and that's what we kind of we kind of move forward on on that practical basis as well and it's also this thing of like shades of authentic authentic is this weird like amorphous term and a lot of people use it as like making it look correct. But then there are other people who really want to make sure that all the techniques are correct into making it as well. So a lot of people, a good example is clothes. So uh, a lot of people will get the construction and they will use a sewing machine because that's just the easiest and it's the quickest thing to do. Um, and that is completely fine. That's completely fine. It creates the garment, the construction is fine, brilliant. But there are some people who are like, no, I really want to like, take the experience further and sew the garment by hand myself. And that goes through into sword making. So me and Eric, we just want a scabbard to protect the sword and we want it to look correct. So we haven't necessarily used uh, period correct materials, but I do know people who have tried making scabbards using wood and uh, making it completely authentic from start to finish, which is an entire, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? A whole other uh, ball game and a whole other set of skills that are just absolutely terrifying. But yeah, uh, we have a question, which is: uh, Were the gold ones actually used? Do you think? Uh, I assume they are probably symbolic. Does anyone want to try and take that one? Ooh, this is a minefield. I've just clicked a thing. <laughs> Oops. Hang on a minute. Sorry. Someone answer. <laughs> it's 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 a minefield of a question. Um, because <laughs> it's we, we don't know um it's obviously like if, if someone's made it it's going to have been used in some way but it's whether it is going to be just um a status symbol or not uh is is really the question of it like the practical applications of it of someone making this full golden 
um, scabbard uh, for it to then get damaged or tarnished in, in the middle of a battle is probably not going to be a worthwhile investment. But if you're trying to show off your bling, uh, trying to assert that that social status, then then quite possibly. But it's mm. it's it's difficult to say, uh, at least from my perspective, yeah. from my from my knowledge of it. Yeah, I would I would err on that side as well. I always have an opinion of the flash here, and especially since gold is quite malleable, um, I can't imagine it doing that much protection. But I imagine that the sword would have that would have gone with the scabbard on on the screen would have been equally beautiful and equally blingy. Um, and so I'm not entirely sure if they would have been used uh, on the battlefield. And I, I I think they probably had more of a symbolic. Uh, usage but that's from a gut rather than in-depth research on this particular object. I can certainly say for the most part isn't actually a very practical material. Um, it, it's actually really quite terrible for a lot of different things other than being decorative uh, for much of human history. So to, to deliberately take something covered in gold, particularly quite thin gold that's been elegantly decorated onto a battlefield scenario does seem rather reckless. But given the way that people have behaved throughout history, there's always that possibility that it could have happened, but I would not put money on it being something that was expected. Yeah. Uh, we just had a, a rather more technical question, which was, where was it found, a burial? I will say that I am going to say, I don't know. I need to do more research into it. Um, but I know it was from, I think I have a link. I think this one was from the British Museum. Yes, that was from the British Museum. Um, so I need to move some things so I can read and see if it says where it was from. Let's go. Yeah, so, uh, resources like the British Museum are really good for this because, um, I mean, I didn't know the answer to that, so I've literally just Googled it and I just typed in British Museum gold scabbard and it's come up with the sword sheath, the same photo, um, sort of the item number, but also what series it's part of, um, which again are these resources that we do have available for, like, not, not we as in immortals, but everyone has available to it. So it is a case that for the most part, this information can be fairly accessible, but yeah, I've got no idea. Um, unfortunately, not too well versed with um, where this particular artifact was found. Yeah, um, a lot of the case with reenactors is again, uh, enthusiastic amateurs, and this is there's a long to do list of things to double check of where things are found. But at the moment, we're just relying on experts in terms of uh, when things were dated and uh, what and where they were found as well. Um, and hopefully we can synthesize that into some more into some more detail in the kit guides. But for the moment, it's just finding all the sources, which isn't too bad. If there's more sources and more resources online than people think there are for Achaemenid Persian stuff. Most of the images on these slides are from the British Museum or the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And uh, I'm going to do a very quick plug. Uh, these slides, I'm going to make sure they're available to download uh, on the Immortals website. So if you would like to uh, check out any one of these images in more detail. Uh, I hope I will have put the links on all of them to where I found them on, on the website. The, if any one of these in individual items you find particularly interesting, you can have a look in more detail. Um, I do want to backtrack very quickly, just go off topic, and I just want to congratulate Eric because he did say that his 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 doctorate is not conducive to to immortals reenactment at all. But I think he just disproved that there. So I'm very proud of yeah. Eric for getting his his doctorate. <laughs> I have, I, I'm, talking I'm about gold. There. Yeah, I, there is there is an occasion that every now and again where I will hear sometimes a fellow historian who's also a reenactor make some statement about the use of a material, and I'll just sort of look at them as if to go, uh. No, that's that's not how that material works. <laughs> like suggestions of using certain things for certain purposes, and I just have to say, if you did that, it would break, or if you did that, you'd be there forever. Mm. Yeah. Um, so going on to a question that I had, which I actually don't know the answer to for you two. Like, if like obviously we've talked about what your favorite weapon is, but what is your favorite bit of kit that you've either bought or made that you that you have? Like, is it like a single item? Is it military? Is it living history? Like civilian use? What what would you say is your go to? Sorry, I think I missed some of that question because the connection here isn't great. <laughs> All right. Uh, basically, what's your favorite bit of kit? 
my favorite bit is not actually Persian and it's not Greek. It is this, which is a, a scale belt that I made. Do you I want to stop sharing? So oh, yeah, stop um, sharing. Sorry. I'm being very British there. Oh, I'm terribly That's why sorry. I'm here. Uh, it's actually a Scythian scale belt. Now, the Scythians are quite popular in a lot of the ancient Greek stuff because it's one of the very, very rare occasions that as a woman, you can portray a woman and not just a woman in, hist in history, like there's loads of women in history because otherwise the human race wouldn't exist, but portray a woman fighting, which is really exciting. And there are burials with women with bits of scale uh, on scale belts like this. And in fact, there's a great grave, uh, it's in Russia somewhere of a Scythian 12 year old girl buried in head to toe scale armor. So I really love this because it's, uh, so I never get a chance to wear it. it. Goes around the waist like this. You tie it up like this. And on the inside, there is this loop that you can, you can dangle things from like the sword that Eric was using or a, a bow case that you can use. So this is, this is my favorite piece of, of equipment that I own full stop. I love it. And uh, Eric? So even though I mostly portray Persians, I'm, I'm also wearing like this full shirt of scale you've already heard, had a, a glimpse of. And while this, I was very proud of, of making this, because I bought the scales, it was very much just a case of four months of stitching. Like, so that, that I didn't, like I felt proud of doing it, but I felt sort of more proud of um, making this. So this is, this is my Greek style linothorax. And the reason I'm more proud of making this is because I made every single aspect of it. So all the, the brass fittings, I bought the rings and the brass and the rivets, all the scales, I actually cut them from sheet brass by hand, drilled all the holes and stitched this all on. The tablet braid to bind down all the scales, I actually learned how to tablet braid. Like I, I got Ellie to teach me how to do tablet braiding, and then I, I did that and sort of I've stitched that all along there, and I've done all the paintwork on it as well, uh, with my googly eyes on the back. Um, so yeah, even even though it's not Persian, I think this was sort of like one of my big projects I did last year, and I was just really proud of it. And I plan to do pretty much the same thing, but for now a Persian piece of armor. I'm going to do something similar. Um, now that I've sort of learned the skills and sort of prove I can do it. So I'm really happy with that. I actually have a slide that I'm going to show you that are the uh, ancient, um, the ancient bits of armor that we've based some of this on. So I'm being really terrible screen share. So bear with me. And so I think that leads uh, into the, one, the next, I think that leads yeah. into the next question that's been asked as well, Ellie, um, of how do we know what to paint uh, onto the armor or onto the shields? And things like that so that should hopefully tie into if ellie's screen connects uh <laughs> <laughs> sorry um i hope you can see the screen <laughs> um the, i found a source literally today that i i need to get more information on of uh these accumulated era scales in the peachy museum in uh i think london which i just need more information about which is just fantastic and they're all made of iron as well which i think is something that is really fun. I find really fun because I do near a Syrian period to explain to people when they say, oh, wouldn't these things be made out of bronze? And I sit there and go, well, no, because the Middle East had iron and had been using iron for several hundred years at this point. So it's really, it does make our sourcing a lot easier than if we were doing Greek scale, because in Greece, they would still be using bronze. We would have to find bronze style or bronze looking scales at the very least, whereas we can use things that look like iron, which is much, much easier to source than having to find really hard uh, brass and everything. Uh, but I wanted to show this slide because of the scale and also because of this helmet, which is one of the rare helmets that we have left from the Persians, which is famously taken to Athens after the Battle of Marathon. Um, and also the part on the far right is an image of an Ethiopian soldier in the Persian army wearing what we think is a linothorax. So, I'm hoping to find more sources to see exactly what kind of linothorax is Persians wore as well. So I'm going to stop sharing so Eric, Eric can show his version of the helmet as well. 
there you go unless he's frozen i hope not yeah so one of the things that we certainly find and i think almost all reenactors whatever period they do can appreciate this is that one of the major limitations so this, so this is the sort of helmet i've got ellie's got a similar one as well that we use for for, for persian um is that the industries that would have made the equipment at the time don't exist anymore like bronze isn't a very widely used material so if you want a bronze cuirass to, or bronze scale to be greek you're going to have to find someone who's willing to work with bronze and that's just not used very much anymore same with like making scales for armor is not an industry that really exists much anymore so like same same with making helmets like most people will work with steel because it's widely used like it's very available as a resource so steel helmets really really easy bronze helmets very difficult you'll have to find an artisan who's willing to do that specifically um brass slightly more common but as a material it's more expensive and it, but it's a it's a good halfway house if you want to get bronze looking um, but yeah, that's so. So these work quite nicely. You have to, we have to find a lot of compromises in the things that we do. Like, does it look mostly good? So this helmet actually did have um, an extended plate on it because it was a different design of helmet from a different period. But we sort of realised, well, if we modify this, it'll look right. And so that's that's kind of in the realm we're operating at the moment because there's just very few vendors within reenactment circles that go, oh yes, I make Persian stuff regularly. It's just not something that really happens. So we have to find these clever workarounds and be willing to do a lot of modifications mm -hmm. ourselves. To uh, yeah, that is to go to go back on the uh, the question of how we know what to paint onto these helmets and onto the armor. Um, a really beautiful example of a helmet, I believe it was found in Russia um, and. A, think it might be in the Metropolitan Museum is a beautifully painted and uh, checker patterned Greek helmet um, with hinged cheek pieces. Um, but one of the big uh, things we have from the ancient world and one of the things that's most iconic from a Greek perspective is uh, the pottery. Um, You've got to take a lot of it with a pinch of salt. I'm pretty sure there weren't hot plates riding dolphins, even though that's my favorite pot that, that exists. And hopefully we can find a photo of that somewhere. Um, because it is brilliant, uh, but they do show the shield devices. They're two tones. They're either sort of attic red pots or sort of like much older pots, essentially. Uh, so sort of these red figure vases, uh, but they do have the shield devices. They have the images that were painted on the front of it. Um, sort of two phalanxes coming together with essentially an eagle painted onto the front of it, uh, sort of facing out of the pot. Um, these are interesting because obviously they are done to sell the pot. Um, that's why you've got to remember that they are advertisements for the pot. You want to have an attractive piece of pottery in your life, essentially. But having that that source and showing how the armor's painted as well, maybe there's a design painted onto a helmet. Um, obviously, what exists now, the helmets that we find at the bottom of uh, of lakes that are sort of sacrifices and offerings, uh, don't have this paint anymore. Uh, but it does give us a chance to make this this beautiful, vibrant portrayal which otherwise would go sort of unnoticed and everyone thinks all oh, the Greeks, it's all sort of white statues kind of thing. So we want to be able to give that vibrancy, give that color and use those sources that we have essentially. And I do want to kind of say that that also gives us a little bit of uh, leeway to nation as well. So um, I personally uh, went with, oh, so Greek, Greek helmets were painted. Okay, so what kind of things were painted? And I had a chat with Edward and a couple of other people. And it was in the realm when I was like, yeah, I could get into Greek history and do Greek stuff. And I, I bought a, a Chalcadian style helmet and I painted an Amazon on each cheek, each one a different style. So this is a more of a Persian style. Um, and this one was more of the, the Greek style. They're generally known for, for using this axe. Oh, that's something I forgot to take out. I forgot to take out my axe from upstairs. And I had a a, a Medusa, a, 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 a Gorgon in the center to be extra scary. And it's just, it's not necessarily based on a, on a exact copy, but it's a nice little bit of leeway and a nice little um, show that you can, there's still some space for expression and still, still some space for creativity 
within reenactment as a hobby. You don't have to always copy something exactly. Yeah, and it's one of those things that we could do as well. So obviously we are wanted to focus on the Achaemenid Persians and we are sort of fairly blessed with the relief work that we get um, for Persian soldiers. So like what are what we perceive to be immortals or what we can interpret to be um, Medes and um, the part that Ellie showed earlier with the, what we think is an Ethiopian soldier. Um, those have retained a bit of color on them. And so we could see these uh, like beautiful colors that we can sort of bring out, uh, which we don't necessarily paint, but can get weaved into, into the patterning or can cut the cloth in such a way that we get these really um, sort of interesting depictions, uh, these huge hats, uh, everything like that we can get, we can get all this, which does make us stand out from, from other groups because we have this sort of different cuts of clothes, different colors, different patterns, which we can take from these, real sources these tangible items that you can go and see you can well you shouldn't touch but you could touch um mm -hmm. kind of thing like you can actually take that on board as well um and still take that interpretation as well um like yeah. this gold this the gold <laughs> figure in the center with the with the banding and the patterning on it it's not going to be gold in real life um and it would be a bit of a boring bit of clothing if it's white with a white strip with a pattern going on it going down it um we, we can take that sort of see what colors would actually be there in the day and make clothes to match that essentially yeah and something as well that's again this little pinch of salt is you can take inspiration from a lot of the, the more general patterning so things like the border edges of the reliefs and some of the other more intricate pieces of jewelry so um on this i'll stop sharing so you can see a bit better on what i'm wearing i embroidered um, a gorgon on, e not a gorgon, sorry, a griffin on each sleeve, um, which I'm hopefully over time going to fill the entire band and hopefully I'll have each, it's kind of my insanity project, I am going to go insane at the end of it, but I'm hoping that each red band is going to be covered in embroidery, but that design was based on a piece of jewellery, uh, which I think I might actually have a, another slide of actually, because I love screen sharing. Um, I think I've got a whole, yeah, there we go. Uh, give me one moment. Do, 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 do. Screen I mean, I've, I've done something similar with my hat as well. I'll stop screen sharing so you can, can you show your hat again? Yeah, just, so I have a Huron Mazda on the side of my tiara, um, taken from, again, from reliefs. Like they're, they're just a huge wealth of resources that the reliefs are really, really useful. Yeah. And even though none of these are necessarily based on actual pieces of history, again, it's a really cool starting point to talk with members of the public because people who come to these events are not stupid. And if you say to them, yeah, this is my tiara, this is what's embroidered on it. It's, and then you can start talking about Uhura Mazda and the limitations of kit and what you wanted to do and explore and what pieces are actually 100% recreated and what pieces you've had to be a little bit more creative about. Uh, so, for example, the archery stuff, you have to be a little bit more creative about because there's just that many more extra steps in order to be safe. But with dresses, well, I say dresses, with dress and clothing, you can be a little bit more, uh, again, that buzzword, authentic and correct to what you can see on the reliefs. Um, one piece of clothing that I am is the, is the Achaemenid Persian court dress because they have these huge billowing sleeves and they all come in at the waist and then huge billowing skirts and I don't quite understand how it works so hopefully at some point I will figure out how it works and come back to everyone uh, but yeah just that little extra level of creativity is really really nice um, and again, yeah, we do have that yeah. that element within the group of again um, my background in this. I'm I'm very excited to be part of this group because I'm not as well versed in Achaemenid to Persia directly. I'm only really uh, familiar with it in their interactions with the Greek world, which is one of the things that I'm hoping to overcome as well and make sure that I can move towards that side of thing. Just because I know that's what my bias has been towards in the past. But from a from a Greek perspective, what's been really interesting is. Um, someone making uh, the heat on the, the Greek dress, essentially, um, and how people have interpreted the different vase paintings and things like that to actually make them in so many different ways. And that expressionism is, is brilliant because, I mean, I think my first one was literally a rectangle of linen folded in half, sewn, and then my arms went out the side and it had a hole cut in the, cut in the top. Uh, and then obviously like hoiked up to give that sort of pleated look. Um, but we have people who 
say actually it should be two holes in the top so that you go straight through and then it falls over your shoulders to give that pleated look or um i've seen someone um arguing that they've um sewn pleats into it so they've pleated it put a stitch through so it holds and gives that lovely vase picture uh so it's it is a medium that gives so much more freedom to it because we're all working from the same source, but we're all able to engage in this discussion. Um, and that's when you see people who aren't historians, people who are dressmakers who just come out and just go, well, this, this is how I would do it. And it gives you an entire other avenue to look through essentially. Yeah. And like you could see it in this conversation earlier, actually, of when we were talking about gold and it's in terms of status and Eric, the physicist was like, but gold is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and actually like going through the actual physical properties of gold as a material and it's really uh it's really exciting having people from so many different backgrounds so many different technical expertise saying oh well this makes no sense or oh well why is why is it this thing or this doesn't make any sense at all and trying to problem solve and come up with the best solution um there was uh, there have been quite a few light bulb moments I know from a different period of group where someone just goes, oh, this this particular piece of clothing is constructed this way. And then suddenly everyone goes, oh, that matches everything. <laughs> that matches all of the depictions. That makes so much sense. Actually, that um, quite would... well describes our journey to make tiaras. Because when yes. we, I remember when we first started trying to make tiaras work a couple of years ago, um, we made all sorts of weird dresses, some of which worked, some of which didn't quite work. And I think we've sort of hit a point now where we've got a good pattern, seems to give the right impression. Functionally, they're quite good as well. No idea if they're actually how they exactly would have been, but certainly from an impression and a practical perspective, they're doing the job. And so it's, I think like Edward touched on it earlier when you know, you're in a museum, you can't touch the thing. And it's not just for the public who get to go to our shows who can interact with objects, but as reenactors trying to reproduce things, even if it's like just a facsimile or an impression, it gives, does give you a nice sense of how materials worked, what's good for certain things. Like sometimes it's often joked in sort of like pre um, sort of pre early modern periods in reenactment, the leather cord or leather thonging is the duct tape of the reenactment world. Because yeah. it just, it's, it's, it's this really useful material. I, I remember we had long discussions when we first sort of were told, no, everything in this period, we need to really focus on fabric ties. And I had a lot of skepticism on how strong that would be for various purposes. And I'm happy to have been proven wrong. Like fabric ties can actually be really, really robust and really flexible. But it was only through playing around with various different linens, walls and other materials and different designs and how we prepared that or hemmed it that led to us actually having some really good setups, including learning how to weave a tablet, right? Which has been great because now I have a new skill. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to bring this slide up as well because uh, the picture on the far on the right is an image of a Persian in on a as a Greek pot um, with this tiara. So this is the headdress that I was talking about with the tiara, and it's these fabric bands that we were not entirely sure if it would actually keep this in place but it hasn't shifted this entire time that I've been talking to all of you so it's very very robust and I think that actually this looks very similar to what is on the on what is depicted on that pot so I'm, I'm personally rather proud that we managed to make tiaras fit and make tiaras work uh, in the way that they look correct as well I'm very very proud of that um, it's a small thing, but I'm very proud of it. Um, so, to to show like what we what we can do essentially with uh, sort of working essentially remotely with this hobby at the moment. Uh, what are the two of you working on? Like, what's your what's the project that you're trying to get through at the moment? Like, how far are you with it, and what are you sort of hoping to achieve with it? Or is there a piece of kit that you're hoping to get ready for whenever COVID does abate and we're able to have this event with the public and get to share it with them? Uh, is there anything you're working on or want to work on? Well, personally, I want to work on women's kit. Uh, it's a little bit more tricky to get images of just because the images of women in the Persian period tend to be like this big and are a little bit 
complicated because in order to figure out their dress, their dress is very, very similar to a Kimono court dress. So the huge sleeves and the huge skirt, but all gathered in the middle and the construction looks really weird. Because even though I'm a woman, currently I am portraying a Persian man. Um, and it would be nice if I could come off the battlefield and portray a woman. Um, act because it's just, an, again, that little extra layer and adds that little bit of diversity and a more accurate image to time. So uh, at the moment, I have not been able to, but that's kind of my my goal at the moment for post-COVID um, and to try and get that set up. And in the meantime, I'm hoping to uh, work with Eric to try and get, <laughs> this, is, this is where my training comes in, my uh, PhD training. I want to be a bureaucrat because <laughs> almost every, uh, piece of text that we have tends to be um, uh, a piece of administration and I want to be a bureaucrat in the camp with papyri all laid out writing Aramaic going what where is your tax why are you late a really dull stuff <laughs> and to be stamping things with seals and that that's my dream living history um, sorry Eric, I'm going to cut you off but there is another question in the chat which is, do you find differences in how the Greeks depicted the Persians and their weapons slash clothing and how the Persians depicted their own clothing slash weapons? Um, if you don't mind, because I've been staring at these images all day, I take that one. Um, I did have one little observation though, that I have noticed between reliefs and pots. And that's like all, all the Persians in the reliefs tend to have clothing that is fitted, but not, tight like it's it's a sort of a good good cut of the fabric some of it there's a lot of fabric layers as well like a lot of layers and there's a few things where you see things like coats and stuff but the the it looks like the clothes are well fitted where was ever whenever i look at greek sources even when the clothing is comparable and is even in design and patterning it's all very tight like every, everything on the, the persian depictions on the all the greek versions, it's all really skin tight stuff and i find that really odd yeah, that was my main observation as well. And I, and I know that it's resulted in a lot of people suggesting that Persians didn't actually wear clothes, but wore netting and a form of netting called sprang. And I know that someone has recreated uh, a Persian archer on, I think it's the Parthenon frieze, one of the Parthenon friezes, and recreated their outfit entirely in this sprang netting. And it looks really impressive, but it doesn't tally at all with the Persian depictions, where, like Eric said, they're they're fitted, they clearly fit the body, but they're significantly more baggy. It's almost like a comparison between um, straight jeans versus skinny jeans is the difference in terms of the cut and how figure hugging they are. Um, and even then, there's still a difference in terms of the some of the later pieces of pottery with the Greek in the the Greek style pots. Um, they have very, very skinny arms and very, very skinny legs and everything's really skin tight, but then they get to the body and it's all very flowy, almost like a kit on, um, which is also really interesting. Um, I'm sure there's a paper in that somewhere and I'm sure someone has done a paper on it somewhere, which would be really interesting to look at. It's um, good to say, Ellie, on your on the helmet that you showed your your, Cal uh, your Chalcidian, um, because that's a Greek on one, that's a Greek depiction on one side and a Persian on the other, a Persian first style depiction. Does is that difference visible there? I, I just can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, so this is um, so in Greek uh, pottery, they would depict Amazons as Persians. So on this side, I have an Amazon as a Persian, and you can see it's very skin tight. So this is based directly off of a pot and I tried very hard to keep the musculature that was clear on the pot. But then the other side was an Amazon as a Greek, uh, which is the other way that they're depicted. And the only way you can tell they're an Amazon from what I can understand is their use of this specific ax. Um, but yeah, on these types of depictions, they're very, very, very skin tight. Whereas, um, <laughs> yes, with that, with the ax that Eric is showing, if Eric wants to say something and show the ax at the same time. Yeah, so we've, we've seen these axes actually on, I'd say, more Greek sources than, than Persian ones. But they come up quite often, um, and they particularly only come up when they want to show non-Greeks. Um, and so it's, a, it's basically, it's usually, the axe blade is never much bigger than this. Sometimes it looks sometimes like a chisel. And then the other side will have this spike. 
Now ours, we've the blacksmith who made this decided that a spike was not. He he knows what kind of combat we do, and then thought, well, maybe a spike. So he's put this large blob of steel on the end. So you know you'll get poked with it if you get hit by it, but that is far less likely to hurt somebody. But um, it's it's odd because when you get things like this in your hand, you have no idea when you ask, say, a blacksmith to make you something, what it's going to feel like when you actually get it, and what it's going to be like to use it. So. Sometimes we actually then have to, we get something thinking we know, um, oh, it's an axe, you just swing the thing. Or, oh, it's just, you know, a coppice is a sword, you just swing the thing. But then when you actually get a feel for it and you start using it, you think, oh, hang on, this is odd. Or this is actually, like, it's easier to use it in this particular fashion. I think um, one thing that I would I'd recommend if, if anyone watching is really interested to see what, like, these axes and to an extent what the, the Greek what i would call the greek counterpoint which isn't an axis a spear um can do to the armor and weapon of the day is if you have a look uh it, literally if you just google uh corinthian helmets or greek helmets um there are a number of sides i believe it's at olympia has got a absolutely humongous catalog of them and it's usually just rows and rows of these helmets which have very small um sort of square cross-section puncture wounds in the top of them uh, which are believed to either be from uh, or very thin slits, which are either these like almost needle point um, axe heads, um, which sometimes don't have the axe blade on it, just that spike, just that pick, um, or what the Greeks use these day, a spear, a doru with a ceruta on the end, which is a big bronze uh, butt spike. But unlike the Persian one, it's pointed. Uh, and it's got that square cross section. It's called a lizard sticker, essentially. And the idea being you'd march over someone on the floor and just go and just sort of finish them off there, give them a coup de grace. And it's it's interesting to actually see, like from the records, we can see kind of how these weapons were meant to be used and that they were designed for specific purposes, um, which is something that obviously you can see in a number of different periods as well, like if, in, in artifacts which have clear signs of, of damage. Uh, which is something that we can sort of, we can base our combat techniques on as well and turn it into a safe way to use things essentially to get that sort of fluid motion. And that's something that if you're interested in, it's it's well worth having a look if that's going to base a drawing you're doing or, or something like that, like get the dynamic pose right. Uh, it's well worth seeing what it's like on the receiving end as well as what the actual artifact is itself. Yeah, I will say that's something that we're... Uh something that we've been in talks and discussion of, but we can't really do anything until we can safely scream in each other's faces <laughs> uh, when we can train. But we're hoping to develop our combat style from what, we're, what we've been used to, to hopefully reflect these weapons a bit more and hopefully reflect how they would have been used a little bit more because uh, we're used to a bit of a different style of fighting and these weapons do require something different. Uh, when me and Eric first got hold of our swords, for example, uh, our swords are um, relatively small in the grand scheme of things. And we had first got into this period after doing medieval. And the medieval swords are at least another 30 centimeters longer. So then we got hold of this and we were like, oh, this is basically a dagger. This will be really fun. And we decided to try and do a form of combat. Yeah, so that's that's a medieval sword, and in comparison, um, to the small one. Yeah, quite quite a considerable difference. Um, and these these the 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 fact that they're shorter means they're a lot faster as well. And also, the way they're constructed means they're also a lot heavier. So I lovingly call mine the iron bar because that's just very heavy and has dented a few swords I've sparred with <laughs> but it is fine it is completely dent free it's wonderful I love mine uh, but there is a certain style of combat we do called competitive and that's more of the kind of sporty so we have games where if you get hit somewhere then you, there are certain rules that apply and uh, me and Eric gave it a go and after about five seconds we went this is too dangerous <laughs> These swords are too fast, they are too small, everything is going to go wrong. So that form of combat is very much shelved in our group. We're very much more focusing on the show aspect to, and that's largely to try and make things ironically more safe. Um, but what's, uh, what's it- people. 
Sorry, Ellie, sorry to cut, cut you off there. Uh, but what, what's interesting is we'll take it out of a reenactment context. So we're saying that we're wanting to base how we want to use these weapons and make it uh, an interactive display for the public. You can take that out of a reenactment context and you can see it in pop culture as well. I think when we were starting to have our, our committee meetings um, and things like that, Ellie was very keen on the fact of in the movie Troy, they based the fighting style in that to try and make it fluid as if it's going around the pot, uh, the vase depiction. So the, the famous vase paintings of Achilles fighting, how it's all very um, over the top flamboyant sort of overarm and underarm thrusts and sort of going up on one leg. And obviously it looks fairly dynamic and they actually use those to inspire the fight scene between Achilles and Hector, which once you see that realize it does look a bit weird actually, but it does look more like this sort of elegant dancing style. So you can see this like it, it, this whole idea of what we're doing in reenactment can be extrapolated into just like common pop culture, um, which is really interesting in how it can influence things. Sorry, no, that was a bit of a tangent. But so I'm going to kind of, yeah, I'm going to slightly change the tone a little bit. Um, because obviously we can talk about how much we love this hobby until the, the cows come home. Um, and I wanted to ask you something a little bit different. And what do you think is the biggest challenge in the reenactment community today? Like what is the biggest problem and or the biggest issue that's coming up again and again and again in the reenactment community? I would say one of the issues is certainly the reenactment has gotten, I wouldn't say stuck in its ways, but it has a way of doing things. It has a way that it recruits. It has a way that it trains a lot of people, sources equipment, um, and also tries to find sources and research that I think hasn't moved on in a long time. Um, I mean, we've only been doing it for about nine, nine ten years. And in all that time, the groups we've been in, the way of doing things has not really evolved. And you talk to older reenactors who've been in it for sometimes decades, and you hear of people who, you know, joined the sealed knot back when it sort of started, you know, when reenactment was going in the 60s and 70s. And sort of the way people get recruited and things, it's, you know, a very much a who you know kind of thing. Sources are a lot of uh, popular history books or sort of Osprey books designed for war gamers and it's that kind of thing where you think well we've got so many resources now available to us we've got so many ways of connecting now certainly COVID's demonstrated that and yet a lot of reenactors I interact with it's not really changed all that much and I think that's a lesson I hope that a lot of reenactment groups will learn from this sort of period of general hiatus of the hobby. So what kind of things do you think should change in reenactment? Like what kind of things that you've mentioned about recruiting, like how would you think that should be updated? Well, at the moment, a lot of recruitment is basically, well, a lot of it still relies on the way, um, the way Edward was recruited. So somebody sees something cool at a show and then has the courage to go up to the group after the, the event and then ask for more details and get involved, which is actually quite a big step for public interaction, like certainly from the other side of it, I would really not expect somebody at a show to come up to us at the end of it or halfway through and go, I want to join you, how do I join you? Like the public tend to generally not do that um, because of course you, you, it's, it's a big society that you're joining. It's a big club, they all know each other. It's that's quite a big step. And the other side of recruitment tends to happen in a lot of like uh, university societies as well, like university groups. And while that's, great it's I think the direction they should be moving in is recruiting sort of from more um from different locations because obviously like Ellie's already talked about the shows tend to happen at these remote events that happen in fields where usually only sort of middle class people can kind of get to them and it's the same sort of audience but you sort of think well maybe we almost never do shows in cities which to me feels like a bit of a missed opportunity for outreach and, and recruitment into the hobby to keep membership strong and keep interest going. And so I think a, a general move towards a more diverse openness to membership needs to be the, the, the direction that people move in now, as well as just a, a 
better online presence for a lot of reenactment groups. You know, you don't see it a lot actually. And finding out details about reenactment groups, we have found from you know when we were talking as a committee trying to form our presence, we were sort of trying to look into what other groups were doing, and a lot of groups, um, other than a few very large ones, don't have much of an online presence. And that to me seems like a bit of a, a problem, mm, especially today. Um, Edward, what do you think is the biggest challenge? reenactment today um so i think COVID. there's yeah so covid's a big one um but <laughs> i think there's it's 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 a very difficult conversation to have um in some ways one, one small thing is in the uk saying that you're doing a keymanid persia or greek or uh, scythian reenactment or uh, things like that is just going why aren't you doing something british but why aren't you doing british history is is a question we get asked a lot uh, but the the other side of it is this is an area of history and i've touched on it earlier where my own uh, involvement of it has been a very Eurocentric Greek side of that way of looking at things of the Greeks are the defenders of Western civilization fighting off the barbarian horde, which just is not the case. And it's that that I grew up with, not not intentionally or anything like that. It was just that that was the involvement that I had and that was the narrative I was raised with. I went to university and I was able to sort of start getting around that and start talking to Ellie and Eric and realizing this is something that we can really do. It's that that overcoming that narrative whilst maintaining in the in in sort of the way we find society at the moment is making sure we do that in a sensitive way because we realize we are a committee of three white people um doing sort of near eastern reenactment that is something that we are sort of very sensitive towards and we want to make sure we do it justice but also justifying the way we're doing it to make it accessible to realize we're not all going to make gold plated scabbards we're not going to make the perfect cut of clothing we want to do it so that as many people who don't have this involvement and this interaction before can get into this hobby and give it a go and it's justifying that that tightrope that we're walking between being appropriate and being authentic whilst giving as many people a chance and taking away that uh, that paywall that can essentially hold people back from reenactment um, which I think Immortals is walking really well at the moment. Um, just to so. just to put that out there. <laughs> I hope we're working a very good uh, subtle, subtle plug. <laughs> I mean, Ellie, what, what would your answer be to that to that question? Because I know you know I've talked about something that might be considered a practical problem. I think Edward touches on what you might call. The, the sort of prevailing narratives, which you could even call popular historical revisionism, uh, which you see in not just our period in terms of reenactment, you see it in a lot of other uh, eras of reenactment as well. I think I have a very different take than you guys because I am a woman who likes hitting people. Um, <laughs> to put it bluntly, we, we know, we know. <laughs> <laughs> I've hit both of you multiple times with swords and axes as tall as me. So. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You um, hit me in the face with a frying pan. Yes, and it was excellent. And a spoon. I hit you in the face with a spoon, which was yeah. perfect. <laughs> but I come to this hobby as a woman, and although it's not like the most diverse opinion, there are a lot of groups in the UK who do other periods who actively discourage or disallow women from participating in certain aspects of hobbies. So I know there are some groups who uh, will, will funnel women towards doing only archery or will funnel women specifically to doing living history or will just flat out say, no, no women allowed. And this is particularly prevalent in uh, things like the World War One and the World War II groups from what I've heard. Um, I've got no concrete evidence. This is all just from what friends in different time periods tell me. Um, and that I think is really unfair because even though, yes, there would not have been a female Persian commander. I am aware of that, I'm not stupid. <laughs> but I think barring the opportunity to portray that, if you have someone who is a fantastic actor, but who happens to be a woman or identify as a woman, and you decide that that reason is enough to bar them when, you, when all of your other options are male and awful <laughs> at acting, or, all of your other options are male, but are terrible at leading an army, then it seems like you're cutting your nose off to spite your face. Because even though the woman may be 
talking in a slightly different pitch. And even though they may be wearing historically accurate armor that happens to enhance certain bodily parts, like I've experienced, there's still going to be a safer bet in charge of an army because doing this is kind of dangerous. We are hitting each other and you need someone reliable in charge to make sure they do the right thing at the right time. Uh, so a really big example of that is for is you don't want people loosing arrows and doing archery when, or, when horses are going to be in the area that the archers are going to be targeting, mainly because then you're going to get a lot of very angry people who love their horses yelling at you for hitting their horses. And also that just feels terrible hitting an animal on the field. Like that should not happen under any circumstance. So you have to be cognizant of things like that and common sense rules. And if the person, the best person for that is a woman, then why not put them in charge? And it's also this thing again, where the public is not, silly. They, they understand that you're not portraying a woman on the field. And kids, if they, like I've had kids come up to me and my friends going, oh, so would you have been a, a woman? And you can go, no, I, I myself am a woman, but I am portraying and I am acting as a man. And they understand that. And generally speaking, kids go, okay, and run off or ask the next question. And they just take it on board. And I think the only people who have- I'll be honest, that's quite a common question you get. Yes, it is. And I think that the only people who really have an issue with this tend to be, uh, older reenactors who view this as an invasion of their boys club. And I think that's very unfair. So for me, I think, and it's an ongoing discussion still, like you still get discussions of whether women should be on the field or not. And I find it really strange that in, in comparison to my day job, where doing a PhD in ancient history, I get more sexism in my hobby that has reduced me to tears at times than I do with work, where I won't lie, it has given me confidence to just go to shut men down when they're being really stupid. But I find that really jarring and it really brings me back to earth sometimes in terms of the situation of women in the UK, at least. So that, that for me is the biggest challenge is navigating that. And I think that the way we're coming at it is treating it as we are 20th century body, not 21st century bodies. <laughs> And we're just pretending to be living in the past. And if you can't get past that pretending aspect, then maybe this isn't the right thing for you. Yeah, as, as we touched on, it's it, it, it this is obviously, it's, it's a difficult question to ask and it is a really nice one to hear if you're outside of the hobby and you want to see what it's like. It's important to show both those those elements. But it's it's nice to think and we sincerely hope that the majority of reenactment groups that are unable to do things are taking this period of covid to have that introspection to be able to identify it and we know this is one of the again we're plugging our society we have taken those active steps as a committee and have written that into our constitution we've we take those active steps because we know these are the problems that either we've experienced ourselves or are very aware of and it's something that Again, even if you want to get into reenactment and not necessarily actually take part in it, but want to make it more accessible for people, that's exactly what the hobby needs at the moment. And it's that engagement that we really are after. So not to dissuade anyone, by all means, these things are here, but I'd like to think that everyone is working towards making it a more inclusive hobby at the moment. And we like to think Immortals is a bit of a flagship, flagship for that at the moment. Yeah, I, I mean, I like to think that... Um... I haven't talked about it in depth with you two, but I have, and we haven't necessarily come across this problem, but I know that I have been involved in other conversations of what do we, what to do when uh, a, uh, correct me if I'm using the wrong terminology, a, a disabled member joins, so someone who uh, is differently abled and can't use their legs, because that is a really, really big problem. Uh, is if you can't walk across a field that is literally molehills in certain cases. And I would hope that we take the approach that I think is the current uh, theory in disability studies. It's something that I'm looking into for my own work. I want to eventually look into disabled bodies in the near Assyrian period. That's my own thing. So I've slightly touched on it before. But I would like to think that we would say, well, a wheelchair is an extension of someone's body. So we're not going to take a wheelchair away from someone. Um, so that's, but it's all very much, you know, case by case basis. And there are certain limitations that we would have to think about. So 
in terms of safety, things like uh, would would we be able to uh, would we be able to facilitate them doing combat on the field? Would we be able? How can we facilitate certain things? And that is very much we've taken the responsibility on that. That is something that we have to solve. And if we cannot find uh, a way forward, then we have collectively said that we, as a committee, are the ones at fault, not the person who has joined. Which so often I know that 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 uh, I know people who are not fully abled can feel like they're at fault because they, they're just existing and just want to get involved in the hobby. But so I, I want to make it clear that in, in us, one of the things that I think makes us different is that we're the ones who are responsible for allowing people to do as much as we want, as, as we can get them to do, as much as they want to do. And we want to facilitate it as much as possible. Um, yeah. I think, the, I think the key takeaway is that it's a hobby where you could turn up and tell us what you want to do. We'll look at the sources. We'll look at what we are in the realms of physically being able to do, um, like no Greek fire, nothing like that. We, we can't do flamethrowers on the field if that's what you're really interested in. But if you're interested, in, like, if you want to do a particular bit of cooking or you're, you're differently, you're, you're, you're disabled and you need to have that extra accessibility, that is something that there will be a place for you in the hobby. And I don't think there'd be, I, I've never had an experience myself of someone being turned away or of knowledge of an experience of that. Um, and it is that inclusive air that you will get through reenactment and the, the community that you'll find in it of you can turn up. And if it's in the scope of the group, we will make it happen. And it doesn't matter what extra steps we have to take and what, have to do that that will not be your problem that will be us as a committee to be like this is what they want to do this is how we're going to do it like be pragmatic and just get that energy across and i think you would be hard pressed to find a society which would not do that for you essentially um which again is is something that's a great part of the community yeah it is really nice and actually talking about the community what uh what exactly happened when you are at a show but you are not surrounded by public because obviously shows they have opening hours and closing hours so what exactly happens when you're not dressed like me and eric so um, for the most part it's chores i would say i mean we, we for, for most shows we're camping um it's the same with my experience and i think for, for edwards as well like you, you've got to, you, well, you know, at the end of the show hours, it's not just kit off party time. Um, we, you know, we cook, we've got to tidy up, we've got to make the camp ready for the next day. Um, so, so those sort of things have to happen as well, which, which is nice because that has to be a collective effort because we all, we all use that space at the event, at, like as a group to portray something, both coming in and out of it to go to, combat slots of the arena and to sort of eat to do our living history to talk to the public so that's been a very active space that we've all used and so we all have to take responsibility for it so there's this nice camaraderie I find at the end of the day at a show of doing those kind of chores getting them done together and then getting down to eating and drinking I think as well to, to add on to that the chores are an important part but I think the favorite thing that happens to me at a show especially a multi-period show is that you go outside of your society and get press ganged into a game that someone else is playing um there are some really amazing uh sort of anglo-saxon and viking groups and uh at some events they turn up with long ships and barricades and fortifications for their shows it's like these pop-up wooden barricades and on the day they're shooting uh, essentially short bows or something like that and things like that and after the show closes they set up a target and suddenly there's just this like everyone descends from all different periods with crossbows longbows the horse bows that we use everything like that people are turning up with javelins and it just becomes a party game of someone puts up a pinata and all these people who you've never spoken to before just spend the next hour swapping swapping things throwing and shooting things at at this pinata to try and take it down and it's that intergroup mixing that you get you get just play games like we play like just catching a beanbag like throwing it around and it just turns into this massive event that spans three different campsites and like people are coming all over people are going away for food and coming back with more people and it's just the, the spontaneity of the community that can pop up at it outside of chores and outside of hitting each other is both hilarious and ridiculously fun 
Yeah, I do remember one event where you sometimes get this funny thing where. Go on, Ali. I was I was going to say that I remember one event where there was a, uh, someone found a tennis ball after hours. And it was just after everything had been washed up and then suddenly frying pan cricket happened in front of me. And I was sat there with a bottle of pork going, <laughs> am I too drunk already? What has happened? <laughs> you sometimes get this fun thing at these shows, especially the ones where you have lots of different time periods. Because if, if it's a really big show with lots of public, you spend it's like so much of the day like interacting with the public taking them through what you're doing, you're doing activities, you're doing chores to keep the camp running, you're going to and from arenas for combat slots, and eventually you realise you've not actually interacted with the rest of the event. And so you'll get this moment where usually sometime around four or five o'clock where the public have left, it's not quite closing hours yet and people aren't packing up or, or getting ready for the evening, where reenactors then suddenly go, right, we've got like half an hour, the public have mostly milled away, Let's go see what everyone else is doing. And so you end up with this weird thing where it's almost like a gallery or, or a museum where you have these groups all in similar clothing. So, you know, you have a group of Persians and they're going along and they're going to see what the World War II lot are doing at their camp. And then you get a group of, say, American Civil War and they've wandered over to see what the medieval lot are doing. And you get this weird thing where they're all going to see what each other were doing, and what they've missed during the day. And you get some really nice conversations then particularly if they're periods that are quite close to one another, you know, because you'll, or even the same period, you'll be like, oh, is that how you do this thing? Oh, we never thought of that. Or, oh, you've got a really nice item there. Where did you get it? And you can like then exchange details and like talk about different traders that supply really good stuff. And like that kind of networking can be really, really fun and useful. I think it's, what it's like you get you get some of people who have been like, you were really shiny when you were wearing all that metal earlier. And like I've been trying all day and they finally track you down after the public go and just went, can I try that on? And it's literally, you just play dress yeah, up in yeah. other people's kit. You just like, you're immediately putting helmets on people. You're strapping them into armor. You're being handed a blank firing machine gun, just going, this is much different from a sword. Like that, that kind of thing. You're just like getting all this stuff going on. And again, it's just that massive I can like it just it's a community that's all I can say it just keeps like coming and people you've never spe spoken to you may never speak to them again and you see him two years later and it's like that's the guy that's the guy who put the shiny thing on my head that, that kind of thing like it's like you do get that bond and you do get familiar with people um who you otherwise would have no contact with like just around these events mm, yeah and I think as well another big thing is depending on the group obviously it's just I, I really enjoy taking a time to actually like sit down with my friends at the end of the day, because as Eric said, you'll be busy the entire day. And often like when you're meant to be eating, people will be coming up and asking you stuff about the camp because they've been busy doing their own stuff. But then once things start to mellow down and you've got a fire going and people start like sitting around it, then suddenly songs start singing and you can start chatting to your friend and like, very drunkenly singing terrible folk songs really badly. <laughs> Often until uh, there's normally a curfew at like 11 or 12. And th that can also be really fun. And then talking for hours afterwards, there was one show where I ended up talking until 5 a.m., crawled into bed after seeing that it was light outside, had two hours of sleep and then had to do the next day on two hours of sleep, which was not great when you're meant to be commanding an archery unit. <laughs> But it was great. Although you'll also get those dedicated souls. You'll get those dedicated souls who, as soon as it's the end of the day, the first thing they do is they get their armor off and they just start working on it or repairing it. Yes, for sure. That you, that's you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's just it's it's this whole it's this whole thing both inside and out, and it's like as soon as you like there are people who i've met and um like suddenly come back and then to feed back into what we're doing at the beginning this like so the circle of wargaming video games reenactment it's immediately like you see one person once and you end up playing video games with them for six months um like playing games together um or just having a skype call or something like that so it's and then you start talking about the hobby and then you start talking about life outside of the hobby and you just get sort of everything going together in this big circle which is just great yeah, I will say that some of the best friends I have, I made through reenactment, for sure. Um, and that's also partially because what we do is relatively dangerous and you have to trust the person you're fighting against who won't 
that they won't actually hit you. So that's a really yeah, big a part of trust in that. Yes. Uh, yeah, so hi, Lauren. Hi, hi. I was just coming on to um, be like, this is an amazing conversation. I want to know if you guys have more things that you want to specifically talk about, because we definitely can keep going. Um, that's why I didn't stop you, because I didn't want to cut you off. It was right in the middle of when Ellie, too, was talking about like women and reenactments and everything. And I was like, okay, I'm obviously not cutting her off talking about this. <laughs> um, so, um, but yeah, anyways, it, I mean, it's it's been great listening to you. And uh, again, I, I don't know if I actually said this at the beginning of the event or not, but a lot more reenactments in America are on the Civil War and not so much ancient reenactments. So I don't really know much about either, to be honest, but it's really interesting. Um, so yeah, just, I mean, you can keep going if you have more points you want to bring up just because you were bringing up like important things to bring up about like the reenactment community in general that I think are good things to include in this recording that will be posted that people can watch about it and everything, you know? So, um, yeah. Well, I think, um, I, I think we'll have just one more. What, what were you going to say, Edward? Oh, no, no, I was good. I was, I'll be quiet. It's fine. <laughs> That's the, the chair is talking. <laughs> Um, I think we'll I think we'll have one last point and probably one last question is on my like big to do list, which is how do you think reenactors can be better used by heritage organizations or universities? Because as like as I've shown, Edward is proof that this really works to get engagement and get interest in ancient studies. So how do you think we like reenactors as a resource could be used more or do you think there's no place for them? in heritage organizations or universities? No, absolutely. I think that it's, um, again, feeding into this experience that I had isn't just turning up to this reenactment event. That's not my first experience with a reenactor. The first experience I had was a guy coming around and doing a workshop on Anglo-Saxon reenactment in a school. And it was, he turned up with, um, essentially we, we spent the entire day preparing a funeral procession, essentially like what would this person be buried with? Why are they buried with these things? Uh, getting to use those things, that kind of thing. Um, from a very young age, that is really impactful on a lot of people. I know it certainly was on me. Um, and I think in museums and in heritage centers, things like that, no matter what reenactment it is, be it ancient world, which, definitely should be ancient world because all the artifacts are really cool but you actually can again you can't touch what's in the display case but here's a replica here's a helmet you can put on here's like the cups and stuff here do you want a grape have a grape out of a pot like that kind of thing like it's, it's little things like that that absolutely make that connection that i mean in my case has lasted a lifetime um and i think it just reinforces exactly what you need to do where it makes that human connection it's not something you're seeing through a glass and it's not something you're reading on a page it's something you're, you're seeing and touching and experiencing um and that can be applied publicly in schools and universities i think just on the note of here have a grape i have made the power move once of wandering over to a medieval camp where they're all covered in head to toe in wool wool chain mail and another wool layer in just this so just linen with like this this brass bowl full of grapes going oh oh are you are you too warm is it 26 degrees centigrade where you are oh no no you can't have grapes no they're not authentic for you no 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 and just walk <laughs> off <laughs> i have been really mean <laughs> so i think because i think my I had a sort of similar uh, interaction with as, as edward like growing up in the uk i think this will be a very similar experience for a lot of kids is my first interaction with a reenactor was at a castle. Uh, it was a school trip and we'd gone to uh, Tutbury Castle in Devon and there were some 15th century knights having a tournament. And I think the thing that really sort of resonated for me was, you know, you, you only see, sort of see these things either on TV screens or, you know, images or sort of that you read about. But when you actually finally get to see someone in in the flesh so you can sort of observe them like 360 degrees see how they move and and sort of the smell as well <laughs> um, oh yeah the and smells. you get to feel the, the, the weight of things and it gives you this sense of immersion and also seeing the person in the place as well um it, it has this real sense of immersion on being able to spin and I can sort of, one thing I'd love to see more of 
is sort of reenactors in and around heritage sites and not just heritage sites, but in and around museum artifacts. Like if you see something behind a glass screen, it would be great if there was just a reenactor like wandering around, say, I don't know, the Caymanid section of a museum wearing clothing or artifacts that are replicas. So, you know, it's it's no longer like theoretical, like the, 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 the person coming into the museum doesn't have to do all the, the legwork in their mind. There's then a sort of, uh, almost like an almost fully dressed mannequin wandering around um, that they can kind of project their imagination. And go, ah, okay, something like this. But they also can interact. It's, it wouldn't just be this static hologram in the area. It would be a person they can talk to. They can describe how it feels to wear the items. Yeah, and I know there's a whole section as well, um, a whole subfield of archaeology, of experimental archaeology. And I think that uh, reenactment is also like, it's not experimental archaeology to a certain extent, but it does give you like, like what you were saying, Eric, this immersion and like other understanding of how things like linen work and how shoes work. <laughs> it sounds very simple, but things like this do really make an impact in terms of how things work. I, I, I remember I had a conversation about just the very simple fact that I had participated in a battle with a thousand people. Um, so several hundred, at the minimum, like 800 people, I think were at that event. And someone was saying, well, I don't understand why this person didn't see what this person was doing. And they were like three units away and, and they can't like see what's going on and react to it. And I was there going, I can tell you when you're on, when you're there, you only listen to the person who's commanding you and they can't see the other side of a kilometer <laughs> like that's just impossible so those kinds of things do really help as well and it really helps you as a historian I can say it helps me understand that simple things like landscape and the topography of battles can really influence how certain things work and how you how the ancient people experience certain things and even if you only even if you're a historian and only work with texts I think there's nothing like trying to recreate whatever it is that you're interested in, whether it's like a pot or an item of clothing, just to really understand how it is to move in that world. Um, I think I made the point to a friend the other day that I know for sure I move differently depending on the period I'm reenacting and the clothing that I'm wearing. So in what I'm wearing, I feel really free to do whatever because it's the lightest clothing that I wear. Um, but the shoes I wear are horrible. <laughs> so that impacts how I walk. But there are other clothings where they have ridiculous sleeves, which impacts what I'm able to do at the camp. I think most of the time I go, this is why I need servants when I wear that, those kinds of clothes. So I think it really does help change your mindset. So I think it's something that at the very least, every university course or every single history course at like a primary, primary school level or high school level, I don't know how the American education system works, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but at every level of education, there should be some kind of course or module where you have to make something as correct to the period as possible. And it's maybe because I live in Finland, so they do a lot of hands-on uh, crafting courses in, in school. But I really think that that's a skill that would be really, really useful, both as like a long-term skill, but just as a, this is how ancient clothing worked to really I think it's really impactful. I, I think if something like that were to be in place at things like universities. So that's my very long winded answer. I'm sorry, I tend to rattle on for ages and ages and ages. But I think that's a pretty good point to end on, I think, because I think we've probably made the case that reenactors can be a useful resource. <laughs> yeah, uh, and of course. Yeah, and SASA is all about outreach and everything like that, too. And it's another thing like video games and stuff that can get younger people interested and all of that, you know. Um, and I love this idea about the museum because kids would love that, right? And I feel like museum, it, I, I feel like it's something that museums maybe do like once in a while for some kind of like kid oriented event, maybe or something. Um, but yeah, that you know, like, it, it's also something that museums are in on this world of this like downward trend of interest in them like you know even more modern art museums and stuff um especially obviously with covid but um just 
you know, with things being digitalized anyway, people feel less of a need to do things in person when you can see it in one second on your phone or your computer. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, just again, this is why I didn't want to cut you off because we were talking about like really good points that all go along with stuff um, that are why SAS as an organization in general, to be honest. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So yeah, I mean, you guys, this was a a wonderful discussion. Um, Amazing points. It's just so many, as as I think I was saying right before we started this live event, um, because you do like real life reenactment kind of stuff, it it hits on every point of the ancient world because you're doing everything that ancient people would have done. So we could have a whole expert Q&A just on military stuff, just on women cooking, just on women doing this, doing that, let alone what men were doing. (laughs) Um, So yeah, thank you guys so much for coming and doing this. It was an amazing discussion. Thank you everyone that was coming, came to watch. And the recordings as always will be posted on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. Um, any, any last goodbyes? Well, thank you for having us and hopefully we'll be, we'll be back to talk about some more really cool stuff. I have a whole bunch of stuff I wasn't actually able to show. (laughs) That's all to do with like being in camp and again, shoes, I hate the shoes, but, uh, but I have a whole bunch of other stuff that we could have whole other live events just on things like, how do you do cooking? (laughs) Mm, right exactly and as i was saying to ellie before cooking is one of our favorites at sasa in recipe videos so we may we might need to do that <laughs> yeah just just to echo that i think yeah thank, thanks so much for giving us the, the opportunity to not only talk about reenactment but also this this new society that we've put together which we hope will embody everything we've spoken about uh and also if you do anything like regarding Wargaming, uh, video games, anything reenactment based, put it on our Facebook. We want to see it. If you want to play Rome Total War, send us a message and we will do it um, because it's fun. Um, but yeah, we'd love to see like if people want to get in- interacting with it, even if it's not through reenactment, just shoot us something on Twitter, shoot us something on Facebook, let Sasa know, make sure that so they keep the interest going. Yes, and I put the links in the chat to um, the Immortals Reenactment Group. And then, of course, go to saveancientstudies.org to find, like, everything about Sasa. Um, Eric, sorry, did you want to say anything, too? Yeah, I mean, thanks very much for having us. It, it, I mean, we, we could talk on and on and on about reenactment because it's a huge part of our lives. And so this has been a really great opportunity to do that. I mean, I'm, I'm always happy to show off kit. I mean, I made a whole hoplite shield, so, like... I just I just can't stop myself. Um and like the Arcadia gaming sounds really, really cool. So like I'd say same echoing Spartan, like definitely hit us up on that because I'd absolutely love to be involved. But yeah, if you want us back, I'd I'd be really happy to do that. Um so thank you for giving us this forum, really. Oh yes, it's awesome. Thank you for coming. As Ellie said, um there's like five at least five different things we could specifically do on it, right? <laughs> um so anyways, thank you everyone in the audience too for coming and have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thank you.